Well, we've been talking about stewardship, the lesson series of stewardship in the age of self, and this is the, the 12th week that we have dove into this, divined into it. We've been talking about it. Praise the Lord. And we're going to start to talk about something that I haven't taught here since 2016. It's called the Four Seasons of Prosperity as it relates to stewardship in this age of self. So go with me to the book of Ecclesiastes this morning. The book of Ecclesiastes. I know we've started uh, most weeks. We're going to read the scripture several times today. We started most weeks with a different foundational scripture, and we'll have that scripture back when we talk about it again. But this is very important when it comes to what we've, the area where we're going into and what we've talked about. It says, to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. Father, we thank you that you are the director of the seasons and the times. Father, that we live right now not only in this chronos, this chronological time, but we live in this kairos, this appointed time, this time of calling that you've called us, the church, to this specific moment to bring the kingdom of God to this world, to share with them that the poor don't have to be poor, that the sick don't have to be sick, that the confused can have peace, that there is a better way, a kingdom way. And we thank you, Lord, that for every purpose that you have espoused, for every principle that you have given in your word, Father, that we will adhere to speak that truth. For you are the truth. You are the way, and you are the life. And we give you praise, honor, and glory this morning. Amen. So let's just review a little bit, because last Sunday was Easter, and um, I think I saw more Easter eggs per capita, per kid, leave this place than I'd ever seen in my life. Uh, fact is, uh, Pat's son, as he was leaving, now this was just the first basket. Now, it, you know, little Easter baskets when I was a kid, you know, like, like, no, this was like this big around and this tall, completely filled with eggs, and he's carrying them to the car. He goes, I've never seen so many eggs, and they weren't even done. Nora was still out collecting stuff. There was, Pastor Tina made sure that it, it represented God, a fruitful provider. Amen of all things. But um, we, skip, we weren't talking about this last Sunday. We talked about the resurrection. So I thought it'd be good that we review the stewardship in the age of self. Where we've come the last 11 weeks as we enter into this week 12. See, we have entered a new age. An age of self-focus. And the more self-focused a country, a people, a society becomes, the less God-focused they become. But we are stewards. According to Marion Webster's from the 1828 edition, it says a steward is a minister of Christ whose duty is to dispense the provisions of the gospel, to preach the doctrines and administer its ordinances. And then we saw that God expects us to do something with the talents that he has given us. In fact, as he said, those who use their talents correctly they're to enter into the joy of the Lord. Hallelujah. But he said, for those who don't use their talents for him, that just bury them, cover them up, and don't become what God has called them to be, he called those people wicked and lazy servants. Now remember, I didn't say it. He said it. He also told us that those who have a slack hand are the ones who become poor. In every area whether there's slackness, whether it's their spiritual life, whether it's their physical life, or whether it's their financial life. Wherever there is slackness, there is poverty in those locations. We explored the principle of life's blessings contained in the Old Covenant and in the law. We saw that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Under the Old Covenant, man served the law, but under the new covenant, the law serves man. Why is such a better way? I much rather have the principles of the covenant serving me than me getting up every morning trying to meet every dictate of the law. And a couple weeks ago, we started to discuss biblical financial 
stewardship. And we are going to start talking about the four seasons of prosperity. It's, it's also interesting to me that the Bible contains more information, more topical um, studies, more scriptures on finances than any other topic in the Bible, more than prayer, more than salvation, more than the kingdom, more than the Messiah, more than the, the return of Christ, more than the resurrection. Finances and financial stewardship. But because of several things, first off, historically we know that the church tried to keep the people when I say the church, the religious leaders back during the Dark Ages tried to keep the people poor and uneducated. Because if they could keep them poor and uneducated, they could keep them in control. They could control them. They could dictate and make them slaves and servants to serve their religious purpose instead of God's religious purpose. We know also that there has been a spirit of greed and corruption that has come in over the years of the Protestant church. And so what happens is, in order to try to, to stop the improper teaching, is the church just throws the Bible out with the bathwater, rips sections out and says, no, we don't talk about money here. You know, the root of all evil is money. However, the Bible doesn't say that. I mean, people say it all the time. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. That's, that's the, the roots of greed. And we're never called to be greedy. But we are called to be prosperous financially. Abraham, who is the father of the church, he's the father of the nation of Israel... If you go read Genesis chapter 12 forward, you'll see where God called Abraham and promised to make him a people, to make him a nation, and through that lineage, salvation would come, or Christ would come, to bring salvation to the world. And one thing about Abraham, he may not have started this way, but he was rich when he ended it. In fact, is he was so rich that he and his brother-in-law couldn't even remain in the same place. They had too much stuff. So they divided their stuff from each other to give room for their prosperity to continue to grow. And so if money was an evil or a bad thing, then why did God go out and have fellowship and receive the money from Abraham? Well, the same reason why there's over 2,300 scriptures in the Bible related to finances is because money is a tool. Prosperity is a tool. Financial, uh, the financial uh, increase is a tool for kingdom growth. And we're going to talk more about that when we talk about the four seasons of prosperity. So I'm going to read Ecclesiastes 3.1 again. To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. So we probably first ought to understand what prosperity is biblically. A good place to start is in the third epistle of John. In verse 2, it says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper. Now, it's interesting that one of God's apostles says that he is standing with, he's praying for, he's believing for, his hope is in that you prosper. So if, if money was bad, why are the apostles praying that you even today prosper? He says, I, it is my desire, it is my prayer that you may prosper in all things. Well, he was just talking about spiritual things. No, John went on to clarify. He says, I'm talking about all things. Not just spiritual. Yeah, spiritual prosperity is important. Your relationship with God is important. But it is my desire that you prosper in all and if you prosper in all things, that includes being in health, even as your mind or your soul prospers. So God has a plan for prosperity in the life of the believer. This word prosper is the word yodio. Yodio is an interesting word. It means to succeed in reaching, to succeed in business affairs, and to have a prosperous journey. 
Dr. Paul Yonggi Cho from South Korea named his church Yodio Full Gospel Fellowship and at one time was the largest church in the entire world with over 700,000 members. Because see, he got hold of God's prosperity. Now, he didn't start that way, but he understood the importance of seeking the heart of God and started to call a nation to prayer and a time to come back to God and understand the principles of God. See, when the Bible speaks of prosperity, it's talking about the ongoing state of being prosperous. It is for the sake of fullness, for the benefit of the kingdom. See, prosperity is not about you having more Cadillacs in your driveway, or having more vacation homes, or having the biggest jet to fly in, or having the most jewelry, or any of those other things that the world considers prosperity. You know, prosperity in God's eyes is not smiling and having a golden smile. You ever seen guys like that? They smile and all their teeth are completely gold. That is not the purpose. The purpose is the benefit of the kingdom. So it's for our spiritual relationship with God. To prosper spiritually for our relationship with God. To prosper physically, which is our capability for God. And to prosper financially, which is our testimony of God. In fact, as the Bible says... That when the church wakes up and fulfills its purpose, it will become so prosperous, it will literally provoke the Jews to jealousy. I mean, I haven't met very many poor Jews in my life. Why? Because they follow the principles that are in here of prosperity. Remember, when God's people left Egypt, they didn't just leave with the shirt on their back and the sandals on their feet. They left with all the prosperity of Egypt, it says. The gold, the silver, the cattle, the goats, the sheep, the chickens, and whatever else was of value went with them. No wonder Pharaoh was mad and chased them to the Red Sea. Webster says, prosperity is to become very successful and to make lots of money, to be very healthy, to be very strong. So an example would be to be successful at your job or your business. So if you have a job, you should be on the front lines of promotion. If you have a business, you should be the place everybody wants to do business with. To be strong in body and healthy. Taking care of this temple that we have. And to have mental peace, and wealth. In other words, biblical prosperity is having enough to meet all of your needs, everything that you want for kingdom purposes, and having enough left over to meet the needs of the world. I mean, you can find that right in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 4. God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that you have all sufficiency in all things and an abundance for every good work. See, our entire life then, if prosperity is, is part of what we're supposed to, to have, our entire life then we have to understand is made up of these seasons. I mean, other than Jesus, I mean, how many of us came out of the womb and had... Stacks of gold, frankincense, and myrrh waiting for us. Right? There are seasons in our lives. There are seasons in our lives. Our entire life are made up of these seasons. There are different seasons of life, different environments in which prosperity is realized. You know, some seasons are temporary. Some seasons repeat themselves. and Some seasons even happen within other seasons. And sometimes when that happens, it makes an entirely new season for you. General 
I believe it was General Norman Schwarzkopf when he was when he was asked how he dealt with all of the change in his life. And if anybody remember him, he was the general in charge of Desert Storm back in well, that's a long time ago now, wasn't it? Back in the 1990s. Um, when he was asked how he dealt with all of the changes in his life and the transition from being in the military to being in the private sector, and he said something to the effect that I have learned that life is made up of seasons. And we have to learn to let go of our past seasons and move into our new seasons. See, the problem a lot of times for churchgoers is they're always trying to hang on to the past. They're always trying to hang on to revival from 40 years. They're always trying to hang on to the move of the Holy Spirit from 30 years ago. And they're never moving into the new season with God, so they're not experiencing the new revelation with God and the new prosperity that God has for them spiritually, physically, and financially. So let me give you some examples. A temporary season may be school, military, or your first job. Those may be temporary seasons in your life. Things that don't last an extended period of time. A repeating season, we all know them. Winter, spring, summer, and fall. Those repeat every year. I mean, at least every year I've been here, they've been around. Now, in Phoenix, it's hard to tell sometimes. <laughs> yeah, they all look almost the same. We do get a second season in the winter for about December and January, but, but if you've ever been to the Northeast or the Northwest, you definitely experience all four seasons in manifestation. A season within a season may be the season of kid raising, the season of retirement, the season of, of job loss or job change. Those can be seasons inside of other seasons. Many times in life, we are unsuccessful, or have lack in an area of our lives, spiritually, physically, and financially, simply because we fail to understand the seasons of life. I mean, let's think about it. If you were on the Titanic and you thought your season was to, to finish the voyage, right? You were on a sinking ship, literally. So we have to learn that you know, sometimes seasons change and there's a lifeboat getting ready to take us to a new destination. Proverbs 10, 4 says, He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent is made rich. See, failure to understand the seasons brings lackness into that area. And many times we're chasing prosperity, we're chasing trying to pay our bills because we haven't seen the cycle of life and adapted to it. Though all the whole time the Holy Spirit is shouting at us in his still small voice, hey, pay attention. I've got some good things coming, but you've got to be willing to leave this land and go to a land you know not of, spiritually. So sometimes I remember Richard back in, I think it was 2014, and you had a job change that was unexpected and not very fun. But you know what? God opened up a new season in your life. Thank the Lord for that. And it became a very good season, a much better season. That happens. But if we hold on, we can get down in despair and lose sight of what God really has for us. Could you imagine if the farmer didn't recognize the season? And in... Let's just say that you lived in the Midwest in Iowa or Illinois or Indiana and you went out in November and decided to plant your corn. And what if you got all your harvesters, your combines and all those things and you paid for it all and said, hey, I want you to show up in February to harvest. See, farmers have to understand the seasons. Just because they want seasons to be one way does not mean they're going to be that way. See, many times we want the season that we're currently in to be a specific way, but God's saying the season isn't that way, it's a different way. And if you'll understand the season that you're in, then you will know how to approach it so that you have a harvest when harvest time comes. I mean, if you're a, if you're a sheep farmer in South Dakota and you're breeding your sheep so that they're lambing in November and December, you're not going to have much of a harvest. Minus 39 and little lambs don't go together. 
Minus 39 and nothing goes together, in my opinion. All right, go with me now to Ecclesiastes again, chapter 3. I want to read verses 2 and 3. And this is the scriptural basis for the four seasons we're going to be talking about. And it says here, there's a time to be born and a time to die. There is a time to plant and there is a time to pluck or to harvest what is planted. So here in verse 2, it talks about the planting or the sowing season and the plucking and the reaping or harvesting season. Verse 3, there's a time to kill and a time to heal. There's a time to break down and a time to build up. The breaking down period is what's called the season of preparation. And the time to build up is the season of cultivation. And for the farmers in, in the room, you understand that you know, everybody likes the harvest. People understand the planting of the seed. But there's a whole lot more work that goes into the preparation and the cultivation than either of those other two seasons. If you just go out in, um, in March, April, May, depending on the crop that you're planting, and go out in the field with your seed spreader and start spreading seed on whatever's there, that seed is likely not going to turn into a profitable crop. In fact, is if you go to Mark 5, he said, he, Jesus is talking and said the word's the same way. If there's no preparation, if there's no, no ground for the seed, the word to get into, when the sun comes up, it has sprouted and it is then killed by the heat of the day. But a crop is the same way. If we fail our preparation season, our planting season will be a failure and our harvest will be non-existent. We know these seasons exist. In fact, as in Genesis 8.22, the Lord said, While the earth remains, there shall be seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer and day and night. They shall not cease. So we know these seasons were put into motion. The principles of these seasons and how they operate are in motion, and they affect all of our lives. So to everything there is a season, Ecclesiastes 3, one and a time for every purpose under heaven. And knowing the timing of things is important. That's how we adjust to seasons. A good steward, remember we're talking about stewardship in the age of self, a good steward must know the proper time to the things of life. You can't steward that which you don't understand. There's no way we talked about Frank and his zoo and how he couldn't steward a zoo very good because he doesn't know enough about lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. Right? So we have to understand the proper seasons that we're in and how they work. Prosperity also has seasons. And we're going to be talking about these four seasons of prosperity. To understand these se- under, and when we understand these seasons, it'll allow us to properly prepare It'll allow us to plant good seed. It'll allow us to properly cultivate and identify and receive our harvests. So here are the four ecclesiastical seasons. The first is preparation. You may want to take some notes on this because this is going to be our next few lessons in, in this series. We'll be dealing with this. The first one is preparation. This is the time of breaking down. This is the time of transformation. This is when the land transforms. Number two is our planting season. That's the time of sowing and giving. And in churches, we hear a lot about the planting season. We hear a lot about, you know, Pastor Thor, Elder Frank, and and others come up here, and then we talk about the planting season quite often because we have a very narrow window uh, to explain to you the principle of God around planting. The third season is the season of cultivation. This is the season of building. This is the season of prayer, study, and fellowship. This is the, this, trust me, this is what farmers did during cultivation season. They literally got on their knees. They prayed. They sought God. And they had fellowship together. And that's what my family did. My family were homesteaders in the 1800s. They did a lot of this during the cultivation season. And then we're going to talk about the harvest season. This is the season that that everybody likes. This is the season that preachers like to talk about because it gets more people to do the planting season when you talk about the harvest season first, right? We talk about the hundredfold, right? But but again, we're we're not trying to teach greed. We're trying to teach prosperity the Bible way. 
So for me to teach you about prosperity from a harvest standpoint is like teaching you to go play a slot machine in Vegas, right? Put a hundred in the offering plate and get a thousand back or ten thousand back. Oh, trust me, there's been teachings out there like that. I remember in the 1980s, it was pretty rampant. And they blamed a lot of my mentors for some of that false teaching. But I've never heard them teach it. I've just heard them be blamed for it. Hallelujah. Brother Hagen, Brother Hayes, uh, Brother Copeland were very sound in their financial biblical teaching. But um, Pastor Tina was listening to a Rama series that, that Dad Hagen was, was talking about. Students from Rama, I think it was Rick Renner too, and student that had said that he had experienced this, that students from Rama were out doing things that they certainly, Brother Hagen said, didn't learn here. Can't believe that Rama students are doing this. I mean, ministers out doing things. And I've seen it in all walks of life, every denomination, because people get this new revelation. They can sell this new revelation with their charisma. You know, it's nice to be charismatic. It's nice to have gifts that connect with people when they're used properly. But they should never be used for manipulation. We've walked out of a few churches over the years just simply because of their manipulation message encased and wrapped in a scriptural Bible message. That's why it's important to know the Word. You've got you to know whether somebody's uh, tugging on your, your you know, bootstrap. You know what I mean? Somebody's pulling your leg. They may not see it that way, but if they're not teaching the Word, then they are. Might as well keep your money in your wallet. Amen? Amen. So let's talk about preparation, because this is where it all starts. This is where your spiritual life starts, with preparation. This is the breaking down and transformation process. In the farming or in, you know, in the farming business, we would call this the plowing season. This is the, the, the time when we're going to get out the furrows, and we're going to get out the plows, we're going to get out and break the ground down, we're going to add you know, the nutrients that is needed. This is, this is our preparation season. This is getting the soil ready to receive a seed. See, our lives are soil, and they need to be prepared. We all have seed in us. The ground has seed in it. I mean, look out in our, our big field out here. We didn't plant any of that. The ground has seed in it. But see, we need to prepare it so that the ground produces the crop that we want in the amount that we want. Amen? Every harvest begins with preparation. See, this is the time where we can learn to believe the unbelievable so we can do the unthinkable to receive the impossible. Now, it's a paraphrased quote from Dr. Jesse Duplantis, but... Um, I'm using it because it's good. Amen? So why do we need the preparation season? Because ground gets hard. Hardness. Ground needs to be softened. You go out and plant seed on hard ground, the seed can't sink into the soil. It just lays on the top to be baked by the sun. See, hardness is found in our, inside our, Right? Mankind's hearts and minds. It's called fallow ground. So just like the field needs to be prepared, our minds and our hearts must be prepared. They must understand what God says about a thing. Amen? Because of sin and lack of kingdom awareness, hearts and minds become hardened to the things of God. Oh, that preacher's talking about money again. There, that preacher, he's talking about healing, and, you know, I was over at that other church, and they already told me that the signs and wonders, they all passed away with the apostles. I mean, there was a lot of hardness in my heart when I came out of the Catholic Church, not because they were trying to develop hardness in, in there, but there wasn't a lot of Bible in there. I knew a lot about what so-and-so said about it, you know, but there wasn't any practical application. And if we don't prepare our ground, our motivations for giving can get all out of whack. 
And it's easily then to get into greed. For where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. So instead of having a heart after kingdom development, you get a heart after your development. Oh, God, look, look what God did. I've got two Cadillacs and a Lamborghini. Man, I now got a 5,000 square foot house. Oh, we only use about 800 square feet of it. But we got 4,200 square feet over there to show off what God did for us. You know, the hearts get wrong. Because there was no preparation. Their financial awareness was built on hard ground. See, most everybody wants a harvest. Here's, here's what I found. Is most everybody wants a harvest. Even Christians who say they don't really want a harvest, want a harvest. Otherwise, they quit their jobs. Right? They just quit. I don't want a harvest. I'm going to stay home. No, but they keep saying that, that this financial prosperity teaching in the Bible is wrong, but yet every day they're out trying to make more money, trying to save for retirement, trying to, to get, get, get. But what's the problem? They, don't, they haven't prepared for what to do. They haven't prepared to receive the seed so that the seed can be planted properly. It's like people who say that their sickness is their cross to carry. I don't know if you've ever heard that one. Oh, I'm, just, I'm just carrying this cross of sickness for Jesus. Oh, my doctor's appointment is on Tuesday to see if I can get rid of it. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Some people even understand the importance of seed time, and they grasp this concept of sowing and reaping, but their hearts are still hardened. Their hearts are what's called fallow, hard ground. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. In Jeremiah chapter 4 here it says, For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground. And do not sow among the thorns. Circumcise yourself to the Lord and take away the foreskin of your hearts. You men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doing. So what is the prophet has prophesied here? Is God talking about hard ground to plant Wheat and corn and soybean and no. He's talking about the hearts of men. He's saying, hey, look, your hearts have become hardened. Your hearts have become follow. And therefore, now your relationship with God is being hindered. And the blessing of the God, uh, the blessing of God is not flowing to you. Remember that the, when we talked about the blessing and the curse, the blessing having God's power working for you. The curse, not having God's power working for you. Right? I mean, that's pretty simple. When our hearts are hard and they're fallow, God's principles can't penetrate. They can't get in. They can't change. They can't transform. They can't make a difference in our life. And that's what happens when our hearts have lain dormant. We haven't spent our time in prayer. We haven't spent our time seeking first the kingdom of God. We've, we are untrained. In fact, is the Bible says that it's land with weed, thistle, sin. It may be land that was previously plowed, but now it's not ready for seed. See, once you knew and you fell away. Once you did, and now you don't. Decided that God's financial principles don't work, or they're about greed. Because you started listening to somebody. Well, this preacher says, well, I tried it for two weeks, and I didn't get no hundredfold return. Nearly 50 times in the Bible, it talks about the hardness of man's heart. There's a reason for this. 
Because it is our ability to receive the principles and the things of God. Let's read Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. Hebrews 7, or 3, 7 through 13. Start here in verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear my voice, and do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion, in the days of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested and tempted me, tried and provoked me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore, I was angry with the generation and said, They always go astray in their hearts. And they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Verse 12. Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. See, The hardness of our hearts separate us from the blessing of God. They don't separate us from the love of God. They don't separate us from the salvation of God. But they separate us from the blessing of God. Because even though the principles exist, we're not in a place to receive them, to implement them. This is why the Apostle Paul was so insistent about the need to change one's way of thinking and emulate God's way of thinking. Right? Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know what? In verse 1, Paul says, this is your reasonable service. This is what you should do reasonably, is to transform your mind, transform your heart, so you can receive the things of God that you may prove what is God's good, acceptable, and perfect will. But we have a part in this. We have to renew. We have to change. We have to transform. Wouldn't it be easier if I just came up here and said, Hey, church, the way to God's prosperity is you just put a 20 in, you just put a 100 in, and just sit back and let God do the rest. Let grace do the rest. Well, it would be good, but it would be lying to you. I mean, the truth is, is we have responsibility. We have to know the heart of God. How can you go and speak nothing but the word of God? Remember Joshua said, don't let this word depart from your mouth, but meditate on it day and night. If we never do the meditating, if we never do the studying, if we never do the the, the searching, the seeking... See, some of us, we need to learn to die to ourselves. We need to set aside our will, like Jesus did. Remember last week? Not my will, Father, but your will be done. And get his will for our life and for our finances. In fact, is if it makes any provision for the flesh, God is not in it. God is not a flesh God. God is a spirit God. He is spirit And those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. In 1 Corinthians 15, 36, in the Amplified, it says, You foolish man, every time you plant a seed, you sow something that does not come to life, germinating, springing up and growing, unless it first dies. See, we have to learn how things operate. We've got to get rid of us so that He can come in and live. Amen? We must die to self. We must choose to become His bondservants if we want to reap the full harvest. And we've got to learn to be kingdom-minded. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to close just because we're, we're running out of time. If I, te- if I go any further, we'll, we'll be here a long time. Um, so let me close with this. And I've quoted it a couple times here today in service. Matthew 6.33 The first thing that we have to do in preparation is seek the kingdom. And this is what Jesus said. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness. Now, let me just clarify this. He did not say seek second 
the kingdom of God. Or third or fourth, he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But see, we're, we're still dying to self. So what's our, the first thing? Pastor, don't you have a three steps to sure prosperity message you can teach me? And there's people out there looking for it on YouTube and looking for churches that'll teach them the three steps to prosperity. There is one step to prosperity, folks. Jesus said it. Hear my word and do it. Right? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things. What things? Well, why don't you go read Matthew 6.33 today? Because you'll find out that everything you want is included in there. Everything that you need for life and godliness, Jesus said that it, that it is accomplished this way. Seek first the kingdom of God. See, that begins the Romans 12.2. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. You do this first step, the second step will, will come automatically. But see, we got to start seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Because true prosperity is about the kingdom. It's about having enough to meet all your needs and enough left over to meet the needs of the world. And that's the people that God wants us to be. Amen? Amen. Well.